Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield here in the gorgeous Phoenician Hotel and Casino with undoubtedly the biggest legend in terms of reviews, in terms of respectability, and in terms of turning up at your event. You all want Robin Leach. How are you? I'm uh, unbelievably well. Thank you, Alex. You are delicious. And I'll tell you, I was just sat by the pool the other day, and one of my favorite people is Howard Stern. And I put in Howard Stern Vegas just to see what happened. And there you were with him um, as the icon of Vegas, the man that knows everyone and everything you are completely unique and you're above the lot of them I admire you for that well thank you I've been here 15 years and uh, it, it's an extraordinary city and uh, it every day never ceases to amaze me uh, it's a city that completely reorganizes um, itself changes itself transforms itself uh, from one week to the next uh, sometimes, you know, we drive around in this city and uh, you look at a new building that's gone up and you take a breath and you say, well, I wasn't there yesterday. Where did that come from? Was that there last week? It's, it's quite amazing. I mean, things change in this city. Buildings go up, buildings come down and uh, nobody bats an eyelid. It's quite remarkable. And it's not necessarily fair. Those who survive don't necessarily mean that they're better than anyone else. You can come and go on a whim in this town. You could be open on the Sunday and closed down on the Monday. It's a, it's a tough city when it comes to decision making. Um, the change that goes on in this city is quite remarkable. I came here in 99 and the, 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 the next change was just taking place with the arrival of uh, Bellagio, the arrival of uh, the Venetian. Uh, when I arrived here, there was, I think, six tiny nightclubs, maybe five tiny nightclubs. Um, everybody was uh, talking about shows and um, entertainers. We'd gone through the era of the Elvis and the Rat Pack and everything. But, you know, they were, they were just beginning to bring in big shows. 2003, 2004 was the beginning of the arrival of Celine, which changed the entire uh, demographic on the strip. And then, uh, whereas it had been, Vegas was the city where old stars came to die. Suddenly, Celine changed that, and now it was respectable to come and perform in Vegas. And that started that change. Uh, Caesars Entertainment built the Coliseum for Celine. Now it was okay to build big um, theaters, 4,500 seat theaters. People thought they were crazy. Uh, who, who would pack a theater with 4,500 seats every night of the week? Um, and then 2005, 2006, the nightclub era started. First with rain over at the Palms. Uh, and then a slew of nightclubs started and then they began competing with each other and now we're up to, what is it, $250,000 a night for a DJ to spin somebody else's music and now we have mega clubs and, and this week while you're visiting from London is the opening of the 65,000 square feet uh, Dre's Beach Club and, and uh, nightclub. I want you to think of this, 65,000 square feet. This is larger than the White House in Washington, D.C., on top of a roof of a hotel with not one swimming pool, not two swimming pools, but eight swimming pools on the top of the roof of a hotel on the main boulevard of the city. It defies logic and defies comprehension. In fact, as Victor said to me this week, nobody can build this anywhere in the world. It, it, it cannot be duplicated. You could only do this in, in Las Vegas. It's become ridiculous. People earning a quarter of a million dollars a night to play other people's music. So that is the era that we are in at the moment. Um, I think that will change. I don't, I can't predict what's coming next. But yeah, you're right. It's a city that changes constantly. Um, what's coming next? I don't have a clue. It's interesting as well. There seems to be infinite ideas, infinite opportunities, and infinite budgets. I'm like you. I first came here 15 years ago, and the wind wasn't here. That was built, and it was just so stunning. And every time they build something new, it's bigger than the last. And it seems like Cirque came in, and that transformed the town as well. Some people resent their success, but you can't doubt that they're all amazing shows. 
Soka is uh, was a, a complete trendsetter, and now, uh, as I reported this week, they're beginning to revamp all of those shows as they go in to not their first decade, but their second decade. Uh, they've got to start thinking about how they add in and mix in hip hop. I'm going to tell you an apocryphal story. It's not a true story, but it's a story that puts it all in perspective. A man who walked on stilts and breathed fire comes to Las Vegas with an idea for a show. He doesn't speak very good English, but he speaks enough. And he comes to a man called Steve Wynn. And he says, Mr. Wynn, I have an idea for a show. Steve Wynn says, what is the idea for the show? And he says, I have all these uh, circus performers and we dig a big hole in the ground and we fill it up with water and uh, they jump in and out of the water and uh, lots of people come and uh, uh, they applaud and uh, make money for everybody. And Steve Wynn says, uh, and how much does this cost me to, to build this, uh, dig this hole in the water, and, uh, dig this hole in the ground and fill it with water? And the man mumbles, uh, $50 million. And Steve <laughs> says, how much money? And he says, $50 million. And he said, uh, did you say $50 million? And the man mumbles, yeah, $50 million. He said, well, what do I get for $100 million? <laughs> and he... he Kila, Kila Liberté realizes he sold the idea. Right. So he doubled what he was offering and he got the deal done and that was the beginning of uh, seven shows of Cirque du Soleil in uh, Las Vegas. And that's the thing. Um, this is the only place in the world where the dice is rolled and the investment is doubled. It's like the old days of Hollywood when you think about it. A scriptwriter took a, a story to... Uh, uh, the people who ran the old studios at Metro Golden Mare and they said we have an idea for a movie and they said well how much does the movie cost and they said well $20,000 and they said well can we get a spectacular for $40,000 and they said yes and that was how Charlie Chaplin started and it's the same thing here you know these are these are the gunslingers it's the only place where you don't have to answer the bean counters and it's the rule of one man you know in here at the uh, Venetian and the Palazzo it's Sheldon Allison across the street at the Wynn and the encore it's, it's Steve Wynn and so if you have a good idea and they like the idea they bankroll it and before you know what happens you've got a brand new idea rolling down Las Vegas Boulevard but much in the way you describe it as gambling I mean there are losers and big time losers you can put something on here and it can die a death and you lose millions within a heartbeat Steve uh, uh, asked uh, Kenny Ortega who was the um, creator of This Is It for Michael Jackson. He sat him down two years ago and he said, I want to uh, create a show that's never been done before and I'm willing to invest $20 million, million to get it started. He said, I want you to uh, make a show that's impo that we can put on the stage what is impossible. That was the mandate. Put on the show, put on the stage everything that is impossible. Can you do it? And Kenny Ortega said, I believe that I can do it. He said, I want you to make what is impossible possible on the stage. <laughs> and after $20 million, they discovered that they could not put on the stage. Let's talk about you because you've had such a fascinating life and no one knows more about the lives of the rich and famous than you, literally. Um, and then, of course, where I saw you most famously recently was I'm a Celebrity, from the insane to the ridiculous, but still featuring celebrities. Your life has been, if it was on your tombstone, Mr. Celebrity, really. You've always been surrounded by it. Not really. I, I You know, I've reported it. I, when I started um, back in, um, in England in the... Uh, we won't talk really about how long it was, like 1958, <laughs> to be honest. But working as a, a cub reporter in uh, Harrow, outside of London. And um, my first assignment, my very first assignment for my local Harrow Observer newspaper, the editor took a dart, threw it into a map of the town. And uh, where that landed on a street, one of the suburbs of Harrow, and I had to go to, the, uh, to that street and get a, a story on the street where you live. And it was pouring with rain. And so I figured that the uh, block of flats would have 
uh, would be a safe refuge from the rain and that whoever lived on the top floor would, would possibly have a story to tell. And I went up to the, uh, the uh, top, top apartment, top flat, banged on the door and a man came to the door and I introduced myself, Robin Leach from the Harrow Observer. And I said, uh, I, I'm doing this story on the street where you live. I don't know whether you know the weekly feature, but it's my turn to write it. May I ask, you're a man, what are you doing at home in the middle of the afternoon? I mean, shouldn't you be at work? And he said, well, I'm working from my home. And I said, uh, fascinating, what do you do for a living? And he said, um, I write music. And uh, I, I didn't know what that meant. And I said, you know, you draw those five lines and you put those little spots on it. And he said, well, it's not really that. But, so he invited me in to look at it. And his name was Leslie Brickus. And all those years later, I'm still friends with Leslie and his wife, Evie. And he was writing the music for Stop the World, I Want to Get Off for Anthony Newley. And ever since then, and Leslie and Evie inviting me into the opening night in the West End of Stop the World, where I met Joan Collins that first night, and she's still a friend to this day. Um, I, I never sort of um, looked back. I found the most interesting people in the world. And then I came here five years later uh, and um, got involved in uh, a thousand different things to do with show business, including, you know, spinning records for Radio Caroline and uh, starting my own um, uh, pop music news newspaper for radio stations across the country. And then winding up uh, doing show business for Rupert Murdoch in America. And then um, producing the pilot for Entertainment Tonight. And uh, Entertainment Tonight, as you know, is still going strong in this country 30 years later. And then I started this funny show called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, which ran for 14 years. And then I started the Food Network and we created Celebrity Chefs. And um, uh, we've had eight hit television shows including Star Search and Runaway with the Rich and Famous and a number of other things and then uh, I came out to, to Vegas in um, 99 to uh, build a television studio right here in the Venetian uh, to save all of the celebrity chefs going to New York to make television shows and to actually do television shows in their restaurants in this hotel and uh, um, we sort of got it started and then the tragedies of 2001 began and crippled Las Vegas and so we uh, we had to fold that uh, idea because the economy took such a hit after you know 9-11 uh, but I fell in love with the city and uh, discovered that um, the city of Las Vegas was paranoid about television. They feared television. They didn't understand television at all, uh, frightened of it. They thought that it stopped people gambling. And I taught them how to um, use television as the best marketing tool that they ever had. And uh, so I have a, a mobile television high definition facility here and uh, we've managed to bring almost every television show in America to to Las Vegas and it's um, it's been remarkably good for the city so I love working here I love finding new things to do for the city of Las Vegas and we have created this monster that it's become called Vegas Deluxe where we sort of live 24 hours a day seven days a week producing all the show business news of the city well let's be under no delusion i mean you could retire you are a very wealthy man and incredibly successful as you say you're no spring chicken right now but you still love it it gives you energy and keeps you fresh um why why are you wasting your time talking to me why are you still here working first of all i love this city i genuinely love this city i genuinely love my business and uh I don't work for the money because I donate all the money to charity and um, I'm just very satisfied. I've had a, a wonderful, wonderful run. Uh, I've produced um, seven television hits over the years and had one diabolical disaster where we lost a fortune 
And I think uh, your odds are quite good there, though. If you've had six hits and only one flop, you're doing well. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> uh, although, and the, and the funny thing was, we we lost eight million dollars on the one that failed, and 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 the host that I hired to run it was a young man called Matt Lauer, who went on to become. He, he when when we closed that show down he went across the street to NBC got a job at uh, a thing called the Today Show <laughs> now he's the but biggest star in news in, in America morning television in America so Matt and I are still very good friends and he's been out to uh, to Vegas and you know, we've provided all the TV equipment for him. What I admire about you, by the way, is your integrity and your honour. You could destroy anybody in this town. Let's face it, you're the most listened to critic. You're certainly the one they want to read about first. But you don't pull punches, do you? You don't set out to destroy people. And you're incredibly polite about what you'll do. You're not some TMZ trashy website that's trying to shut people down. I don't believe that it's our job to do that. Um, I, I loathe critics who take pot shots at people. I don't think that anybody understands what goes into the making of a show or the making of a movie, uh, the making of a restaurant. Um, I mean, we're sitting in Daniel Ballou's restaurant here. This is a um, $25 million plus undertaking. And um, if, you, if you were a food critic and you come in here and you say on the opening night, that the uh, le poisson est merde uh, the uh, the um, restaurant could close well you show me the uh, food critic who can spend 35 million dollars and go cook his own fish and the chances are that he'd probably burn the fish and uh his restaurant walls would have fallen down. So who, who, what right does he have to criticize somebody who is a professional and could do it? Um, um, I try and be like you, I try and be has, positive. The chef has no way of, of, of firing back at the writer. So, I mean, don't you, my job, my job, as I've always said this for as long as I've done it, is solely to be a link between either the artist and the reader, the chef and the viewer, the star, the singer, and the audience. That's all my job is. I get that, but you've been around the houses enough to be able to tell me whether I should be dining here tonight or dining there tonight. Do you see the distinction that I actually would be curious to know if I have one choice tonight in Vegas, which, let's face it, nobody's living here like you or like me here for two weeks seeing 60 shows. So I would tell you that privately, where you would go. I wouldn't broadcast it to the world. But in this town, you have got a million choices. Here's the, here's the problem. What's the best Italian restaurant? What's the best French restaurant? They're all great. Um, uh, here, we don't have bad restaurants in Las Vegas. So that's one great blessing. But there are some that are better than others and more amazing than others. I'd be yes. curious to know that. There, so the, 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 indeed, there are rankings. Uh, but, you know, here, here in the Venetian, for instance, and the Palazzo, which is the sister hotel next door, I mean, I think we've got 28 of some of the best chefs in the world. I mean, they're all on television. They're all stars. Um, you go down down the down the street to uh, Caesar's Palace. Um, I mean, I mean, they're all named chefs. These are these are brands. Um, they're not going to serve a bad meal. They're not going to have a a bad restaurant because. You can't have somebody leaving Vegas and say, you know, the meal that they got from a major television celebrity chef was so disgusting, it would destroy that person's reputation. Every one of the hotels is a city unto itself. If you stay in, in a hotel like we're in the Venetian, you never have to leave the Venetian. I think it's 7,860 rooms between the two. And you have enough restaurants here that you could eat here for a month without ever duplicating them. And in fact, I think that I, if, you, if you put me to the test, Alex, I could give you 365 restaurants, not in this hotel, but in the city, one for every night of the year. If I were to ask you what's the best show or the best hotel or the best restaurant, would you be willing to tell me or is that it's, not it's for very, this? It's very, very, very tough. Um, I, th I think that if, if you do ask for what is the best restaurant in the, in the, in the city, you know, you start, have to, you start to have to qualify in things. For what amount of money? Well, if money is absolutely no object, 
and you happen to like French food, you you cannot beat Joel Robichon. I mean, you know, this guy is is not called the Pope of food for no reason. He's not called the chef of the century for no reason. Thirty six types of bread, I think he offered. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's it's totally out of control. Ludicrous, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I think I got out of there for nine eighty the last time. Is that, there, is that true? And it is, but equally, you can have as enjoyable experience having a burger somewhere that's well cooked for thirty dollars. Excuse me, you want to order a burger in in Daniel Balu's restaurant? I think the foie gras burger here is uh, 165 or 185. Look, you don't come to Vegas to pinch pennies. You come here because this is the ultimate destination for entertainment, the ultimate destination for shopping, the ultimate destination for fun. You say that, but what I've noticed in this town is if you're 22 and beautiful and female, you don't pay for anything. I have met more women this time that have not paid for a meal, for a show ticket, for this, that. It's a curious town that a lot's given away. Didn't we? Look at this face. Nobody's giving me a free meal. (laughs) And look at this face. (laughs) It's true, though. It's It's a fascinating town, isn't it? They give a lot away, don't they, just to bring people in. It's the old story of honey to the uh, bees or whatever it's called, you know. Very fine. I'm going to let you go because you are one of the busiest men I've ever met. Thank you so much for your time. Firstly, it's a great honor to meet you. I'm fascinated by your life and your career. It is extraordinary, as are you. And I wonder what it's like to be you. Um, Could you ever dream that it would have been this successful, this brilliant, and have the longevity you've had? Because let's face it, there aren't many people in the business who last, let alone as long as you have. You know, I never uh, ever set out with a goal in mind. Uh, everything was a choice you turn left or you turn right and I'm still making those choices every day when I get out of bed Uh, I love my job I love my work as Michael Caine has often said what we do beats digging up coal from the mines so we should value what we do Um, I love my work because it's different every day of the week I never repeat anything tomorrow that I've done ever before in my life. What a a joy that is to be able to say. What a joy it is to be able to do. Can you be surprised now if you heard something was opening or something was closing or somebody had been signed on $300 million to appear here or if something was being designed that's beyond comprehension, as you say, the eight pools on the top floor. Is there any shock left or have you seen it all? Um... I keep going because I I want to find the next wow. I I want to find the next blow me away. I really do. You know, that's... um, And I think one of the reasons I'm so content in Vegas is because if you're going to find it, it's going to happen here. I do a lot of work with the... um, medical center here for the discovery of Alzheimer's uh, the cure for Alzheimer's the cure for Parkinson's that's where my money goes into that and I think we'll find it and and if you this is why this is the tale of two cities as you know Charles Dickens once wrote we have this total two miles of absolute insanity craziness beyond belief and yet out of all of this insanity there's this little town around it where we have the new silicon valley and we have this medical center where the people of this community are busy finding cures for medical research it's really interesting think about this a city of a million eight hundred thousand people that plays host to 40 million people a year think of it is the only city probably in the world that has 24 hours a day of everything you can get your laundry done 24 hours a day. You can get the bank open at 24 hours a day. Any gas stations, 24 hours a day. Is it? You never want for anything. The greatest valet parking in the world. You know, I can drive my car to the airport, throw the keys at valet parking, and hop on a plane to go anywhere in the world. Just, just like that. It's a, it's a city of comfort and convenience. 
I love Las Vegas. I can tell. It's inspiring to see you and to see your enthusiasm. Robin Leach, thank you so much for your time. Nice working with you.